Well, I'm Jim Longworth, and welcome to another edition of Triad Today. Coming up later on, our infamous roundtable gets together. We'll tackle all sorts of topics, so stay tuned for that madness. But between now and then, some great guests and information coming your way. We'll give you some tips on caring for seniors. We'll also have some advice on, well, when and why to call an attorney. Now, we'll do that and much, much more, including a discussion of the big community campaign by the United Way. But first, this is Heart Month, after all, so I guess it's appropriate that I have a good friend of mine here with me today. Dr. David Zal is Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, and I'm just learning because our good friend Joe McCloskey sent me an email talking about this collaboration between the Heart and Vascular Center, which is kind of like, it's very unique. There's no other one like it, and I want to find out about it, so welcome to the show, first of all. Thank you for having me. So, now tell me, uh, tell me about this uh, combined center. Tell me about the collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think that these days, uh, taking care of our patients require a lot of a different experiences, skills, and the knowledges. And uh, what we uh, are doing is really have a patient-centered care and uh, gather all the specialties, and not just me, and there are surgeons, there are echo imaging people, and uh, we all really focus on the patient, provide all the knowledges. And so that will give a patient the best of multiple worlds. And right. so that's why we're working together. Well, I think it's a great idea. Now, uh, let's say if I have a history of heart issues, mm -hmm. what is it that I'm going to find specifically at this collaborative uh, center, this mm -hmm. collaborative effort that's going to help me? Yes. For example, if you do have a coronary artery disease or a heart attack, and there are multiple ways you can treat it. You can give a medicine, you can put a stent in, you can do a bypass surgery. In the past, or even currently, many other institutes, and it's a somewhat a competition. Either you get the bypass or you get the stents, and et cetera. And in advanced, uh, Wake Forest, what we do is that we really gather, put everybody together, so provide what's best for patient. Right. And that collaboration, we actually can do what we call hybrid procedure. You can actually have uh, bypass surgery to a certain part of the heart, minimal sure. invasive, and I can put a stent in to fix the rest off. So you end up with the best outcomes and the provide by Yeah, instead of if you're either limited or just specialized in stents, and you say, well, uh, Jim, you're going to need a stent, and there's no other options. I mean, you're sitting exactly. here saying, okay, let's find out what's best for his heart. I exactly. And to combine the technologies together. I, I don't want time to get away from this before I mention that, uh, that you guys are doing some cutting-edge research. Anything new or exciting that you want to share with us, or is it all confidential, or what? No, no, not, uh, nothing confidential. I think uh, really many type of research we're doing new procedures, new uh, devices. But the most exciting is actually a really what we call precisional medicine or individualized medicine. We now have the, the abilities and technologies that can predict one's risk for, for example, coronary artery disease. Wow. And then we can actually prescribe a preventative measures so it's individualized rather than just tell you, eat healthy, go exercise. Am I putting words in your mouth or could that prevent heart attack and stroke later? Absolutely. That's great. Now, guys, there's so much I want to cover and I don't really have time, but uh, let me just say very quickly, children have heart disease as we know, but you don't hear a lot about how they transition to adults mm -hmm. very quickly. Are you keeping an eye on that? Absolutely. So we have this wonderful transitional clinic, basically have a pediatric cardiologist and the adult cardiologist see the patient together for a year overlap. So that will make an easy transition for them to see from sort of pediatric service to adult service. I want everybody to get this heart disease and stroke guide. And uh, you really can't read it if I hold it up. I'm going to hold it up anyway. But on screen is a website, a couple of them. The basic website, of course, wakehealth.edu. But if you go to wakehealth.edu backslash all heart, you can get this guide. And you can see it online. It has all sorts of great pictures. And it doesn't have any pictures of me, but it has a picture <laughs> of you, which is more important. But anyway, I really appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thank you for having me. All right, Doc. Take care. Appreciate it. We'll be right back after this. On Try It Today, and it's time to talk about the United Way, but more than that, it's time to talk about how the United Way is helping the community. We're all helping each other. And you want to meet a lady who's really facilitating that? She happens to be sitting here, which is convenient for this conversation. Debbie Wilson is Chief Impact Officer for United Way of Forsyth County. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I guess I want to start out by asking sort of a stupid question, but when somebody sees your title, Chief Impact Officer, I'm sure they've come up to you before and said, well, hey, Debbie, what does that mean? So I'm going to give you a chance to say what that means. Absolutely. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Um, actually, it, it means exactly what it says. I have the honor of uh, working with our process within United Way that determines where we invest our money. 
So I get the, the, the honor of working with a lot of different organizations and entities to determine how we can best solve community problems and invest United Way funds to, to help. That's an important job, and we can get to some of those ways in a second. Before that, though, just bring me up to speed on this community campaign. Do you have a specific goal in mind of what you want to raise? What's going on? Yes, we're working to raise $15 million to support many programs and services in the community. As I mentioned, uh, we, we fund on a collective impact sort of strategy so that we are looking at ways to bring uh, partner organizations, agencies together to, to work on solving community problems. So what kind, of, what kind of people and organizations are involved, can benefit uh, when we talk about, you know, investing money from mm -hmm. the United Way? What, what, give us a couple examples. Well, we currently support 76 programs in the community. Wow. Funded through 42 different agencies and also two um, collective impact initiatives. And what I mean by that, the Foresight Promise, which is a community collaborative initiative. We provide the backbone support for that. Right. And also the initiative around ending homelessness. I was going to ask you, because those are two big initiatives, and so let's take both of them very quickly. Sure. One, uh, the, uh, what are you doing to try to bring the high school graduation rates up and the dropout rates down? And what are we doing to work on homelessness? Sort of sum it up for us. Sure. Well, the, I'll, I'll start with the homelessness initiative. Um, over the past 10 years since its inception, it has reduced chronic homelessness in this community by 73 percent. Wow. And it has effectively ended veterans homelessness. So that was done by bringing collective groups of organizations that work with the population together. Yeah, Mayor Joins was here one time with Sydney uh, gordon -Ear, and Yeah, that's, Absolutely. I really so applaud that effort. That's great. It's real impact, and that's the type of thing we are trying to do. Yeah. Uh, the investment in the education system is a combination of investments that we make with the school system, funding specific schools to look at strategies around um, student um, academic improvement and, and in increasing the graduation rate. Uh, but also funding community organizations that support youth activities, after school programming and tutoring and that type of thing. And that keeps the kids engaged and that keeps them in school and more, you know, it just goes round and round. You're right. I think Absolutely. That, I mentioned uh, uh, the, the CEO, you know, anyway, uh, Cindy Gordonier, a good friend who's been here before. Yes. You know, she talks all the time about collabor uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, explain what she means. We understand that a lot of the issues we deal with in this community are very complex. Even if you're dealing with something as simple as looking at, for example, high school graduation rates. It's not only the education system that has to be involved there, but there's a community piece that needs to come together as well. Engaging parents, maybe providing other support structures, so no one entity can really address community issues effectively by themselves. Right. So part of the, the purpose of United Way and our mission, quite frankly, is to bring the community and its resources together to address issues that no one entity can address alone. Well, I just think it's great what you're doing and the success that you're having. And of course, to get back to the community campaign, we want everybody to give. And I'm yes. going to put up a website address uh, for Scythe. UnitedWay.org is the general website. Can people learn from that website? And I'm just, I'm, we didn't rehearse this or anything. I'm just, sure. If they go to the website, can they learn how to, to give or is, uh, what's the best way to give money to, to donate to these things? They can donate directly online. You know, we think sometimes of United Way and the traditional workforce campaign. Uh, the community campaign is just that. It's open to the entire community. So we want people to understand you can support this work whether you are a part of a workforce campaign or not. You can go and donate directly online. Because the money is going to help all of us. Every dime. And I tell you what, I just admire what you're doing. I really do. Thanks, it's Debbie. It's a pleasure to do the work. Thank right. you. Debbie, thank you. We'll be right back after this. On uh, Try Today, and the topic of uh, how to care for our seniors is always important. And we have a gentleman here who can help us through that topic. He's been here many times before. We're glad to get him here today. Mark Moretti is Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Ridge Care Incorporated, and that is headquartered in Kernersville, right? It Still is. Still headquartered, although you're yeah. growing everywhere to really? the, east of the eastern part of the state and everything. Welcome yeah. to the show. Good to be here Good always. Good to see you. Yeah, you Let's know. remind folks, in case they just moved into the area or haven't watched the show, um, what Ridge Care is, what do you offer, how far do you reach? Sure, so we are North Carolina born and bred, raised right here in the triad, but we also have communities, uh, senior living communities, everything from an independent living community with assisted living services to assisted living and memory care throughout North Carolina. 13 locations now in North Carolina, one in West Virginia, and we're getting ready to expand into South Carolina too. Uh, I'll, I'll come at this next question from sort of a personal standpoint, try not to make it too personal, but uh, you know what's coming, and that is, what happens if you have elderly parents and maybe it's time to have that discussion about, let's maybe move into a senior living facility. Um, 
what advice do you have on the best way to approach this conversation? It's a tough conversation. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of psychology at play. You have been the child. The parent has been the one telling you what to do your entire life. And all of a sudden, as a child, you're telling mom or dad what they should do. And so it feels a little different. It yeah. feels a little difficult. And so I think just you, you employ some, some very general uh, common sense approaches. Number one, you don't tell them what they need to do you ask them how they feel about things. So instead of, hey mom, I'm noticing that you're not taking your medications, it's, hey mom, how are you doing managing your medications? Right. When you ask them the question, they're now having to tell you, and you can even use a kind of a, a simple little technique. You could say, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being I'm ready right now, how, how ready are you to, to think about moving into an assisted living community or an independent living community? Right. And statistically, they're going to say seven. I don't know why. I don't understand the psychology behind it, but they will. Yeah. And so then you can follow up with a question and say, wow, that's surprising. Why not a one or a two? Right. And so instead of me having to tell you why you should be moving, that's you're now telling me. I didn't think about that. That's an interesting approach. Yeah. And, and the thing is that um, a lot of us would like to think that we can just have mom and dad move in with us. Yeah, it's tough. But we're not, uh, a lot of people don't have the space. Yeah. And you also don't have the expertise, unless yeah. you happen to be a nurse or a doctor or somebody that has the extra yeah. space. So not everybody's in that category. I mean, uh, and, makes and, it, and the socialization piece, right? Them living in your home with you, they're not getting out and about. They're not getting the kind of social nourishment that they need. They're not interacting with their peers. Right. And that creates depression and that leads to all kinds of of health issues. Here's another question. I don't know if you want to address this or not, but about the money situation. Yeah. A lot of times parents want to keep to themselves about their finances. Yeah. And yet you sort of need to know, okay, you know, where, should we go to this facility or this facility? And yeah. to answer those questions, you kind of got to know what mom and dad have. Yeah. Yeah. And it might seem like you're prying. Mm -hmm. how and do you, you are. How do you address that? Yeah, you are. And I think it's better just to be honest and say, you know, we're concerned about where you are. You're concerned about where you are. We need to get a really good grasp on where things are financially. Can I sit down and, and go through some things with you? Can we look at your accounts? Can we look at what you have in terms of liabilities? Can we look at what's coming in every month and figure out what might be the best place for you? Also, reaching out for VA benefits and figuring out if there are other state funds that might be available to, right. help, to help fund it. But, but you just have to be very candid and say, let's at least, even if this isn't a decision that we're going to make right now, let's at least get our hand, hands on uh, kind of where things are financially. Now you've given some great advice, but I'm going to come back at you for, for a second. I'm angry now. I'm going to come back at yeah. you. Now, wait a minute, Mark. I saw you on TV. You said some good stuff. I don't know. I might need some help here. Is, do you have folks on staff oh, yeah. at Ridge Care where if we can bring mom and dad over and sit down and they can, yeah. I mean, can you help with that? You bet. At every community, in, in, any of our leadership teams within the community would be happy to help you with that. They can also, if you're, if you're the child of an aging parent and you're concerned about their well-being, they can help you start the conversation. They can give you the tools that you need to really begin a conversation that can be productive in making sure that your loved one's getting the care they need. I think that's great. On yeah. screen is, of course, uh, the ridgecare.com. And for the radio audience, I'll say it again, www.ridgecare, all one word, .com. Please look that up. And uh, Mark, I thank you for all you and your staff do for you so bet. many people. Thank you. Thank you, pal. You bet. We'll be right back after this. Back now on uh, Try It Today, and I want to tackle a, a topic that I want to do. And I've sort of forced this gentleman in here to ask him these questions, but he stopped by anyway. Uh, of course, Lori Bates, our good friend, David Daggett, attorney with Daggett Schuler, attorneys at law. And Griff was going to join us too, but he's in a hearing, right? Yeah, he's in a hearing. He's in a hearing. Uh, occupational hazard that that's we have. That's right. Well, that's good that he's working on behalf yes. of people. Anyway, welcome to the show again. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me, uh, Jim. Here's, here's what I mean, what I want to do. I want to just ask some basic things about if I'm in an accident, because I've never asked you this before. Um, at what point or why should I call you or any attorney? I mean, it, it, how do you know at what point to call? Well, let me tell you a little story that maybe will help you relate. A few years back, and you may remember this, I was the victim in an accident. That's right. I was, I was hit by an impaired driver, a hit and run driver. I dinged my head a little bit, and I'm standing on the side of the road. My car is not drivable. I've been in this business for 33 years. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. That's amazing. You know, it's uh, because it's you. Because it's you. And when it's you, it's different. For a person who hasn't been doing this for 33 years, the system is overwhelming. You're dealing with, with adjusters, you're dealing with garages, you're dealing with estimators, you're dealing with the medical aspects, 
you're getting lost wage statements for your employer, and um, uh, your income may be cut it's off. It's got to be overwhelming. It, it's, it's overwhelming, totally overwhelming. Uh, so, I mean, it, what, what is the It best? was frustrating for me. Yeah. It was frustrating for me. So, the, the best thing to do, and it's just like anything else that you have, you know, when my furnace goes down, I call somebody who knows what's going on about the furnace. Right, right. When my car breaks down, I get somebody who can analyze the problem. Uh, same thing if you've been in an accident, particularly if you're injured, but anytime you've been in an accident, call somebody who knows what they're doing. Many times when we get calls, what we're doing is just giving some basic advice, uh, guidance, and direction. Uh, sometimes that crosses the line and it needs representation. We're pretty good at about advising people when it is or is not in your best interest to have somebody involved helping you. Sometimes guidance and direction takes care of the situation. Did about three or four of those this morning. Uh, sometimes it turns into a situation where you really need representation to look after your best interests in the right. best interests of your family. Is there anything I should, like if I do want to consult with you, um, whether or not you end up saying, Jim, you really don't need an attorney, here's why, or yeah, we'll help you, or somebody else can help you. Um, is there a point where I mean I, I should know to bring certain things with me, or at what point in the process? And, and, and not really, because once, once you contact our office, or somebody who knows what they're doing, they guide you through that process and, and tell you what you need to bring and, and, and what you need to do and those sort of things. The big thing you need to do, and, it, and it's comforting, is have somebody who's on your side looking after your interest, uh, giving you the advice and guidance, whether it's representation or not. Right. Because remember, the insurance company's job is either to find that you're the one at fault or to deny and reduce your claim. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's, that's their job. Yeah, that's something I, I, I almost forgot I wanted to ask you about filing claims. I mean, it sounds like a simple thing to do, but again, as you said, the insurance company isn't sitting by the desk saying, hey, you know, I looked at my watch today and I'd like to help Jim Longworth <laughs> and, uh, now, in any way. Uh, you know, just right now, I ask you, who would you call? I, I well, don't know. I mean, where, where do you get the number? So you can help me file. What, what do you tell them? Right. Yeah, all that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that, that's... That's the beginning of a process that very quickly uh, can get overwhelming and, and, quite frankly, very frustrating. Well, I appreciate you so. answering those. I mean, I, I know we do a lot of things. You do a lot of things for the community, and we'd like to get you in here and talk about that. But I wanted to just sort of grill you on that because I had some <laughs> questions that I needed to get answered. Uh, up and, on and you like grilling lawyers. Well, I like grilling lawyers anyway. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they, they, uh, DaggettShillerLaw.com is the website, or you can call 336-724-1234, which I hope you'll do and get more information. And these guys are great about sitting down with you and... Uh, Except for Griff, he didn't sit down here at all because he's out helping somebody. He's out you know? helping somebody, right. absolutely. Thanks for everything, yep. pal. Yeah, all right. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. Back now on Trying Today, time for the award winning roundtable. Have we won an award yet? We should. We, we should. should. We absolutely. should get it if we hadn't got it already. Uh, anyway, on my right, but always a political left, Ogie Overman, that great journalist, broadcaster, and a man about town, and wearing one of his own design ties right now. We don't want to get a close up. It could get us in trouble. <laughs> next, to him, next to him is uh, Sheriff B.J. Barnes, who uh, holds fort over in uh, Guilford County and controls the world from his office. <laughs> and next to him is uh, Keith Granberry, who, of course, is founder and uh, CEO of uh, Helping Hands Consultants. Does, does a lot of work in getting people uh, registered to vote this year. I think that's great. Before we get to the topic, oh, yeah, I didn't know if you knew something but uh, Keith actually wrote Trump's State of the Union speech for him. I didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> I did uh, not. Okay. Yeah. I, I did you, not. You don't have to insult the board. <laughs> well, I just, yeah, I, just, I just think people ought to get credit. I can't, I can't get credit for what they like do. That, man. <laughs> yeah, Why are you telling my secrets? Get credit yeah. for things. <laughs> now, first topic. The new federal tax plan will net Duke Energy mm -hmm. about $200 million in extra revenues every year, guys. They still want to go up on our power bill, though. Should the state deny Duke Energy any rate hikes? Okay. I think, honestly, they should put a moratorium on it until the coal ash situation is cleared up to everyone's satisfaction. Yeah, they want to charge you and me to right clean here. up the coal yeah, ash, exactly. too. B.J. I hate to get started with this, but I have to agree with Ogie. All right, B.J. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's right. <laughs> Must be flu season. I know. <laughs> no, no, no. The sheriff does, sheriff does not have the flu, Keith. Okay, okay. Keith, what do you think? I totally agree. I think uh, with these tax cuts and the large amount of money that corporations are making, they should put a, a hold on, on people's uh, uh, utilities. They want, to, they want to get the tax cuts and they want to go up on their bill. All right, now, of course, that, that's being said after we all got very high 
bills last month. Oh, yeah, from, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's already it's done now. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. done deal now. Uh, now, this is something we talked about before, but uh, it, when it wasn't a reality, now it's a reality. It looks like Guilford County Commissioners are going to pay a Florida company $900,000. They originally budgeted 100000 it went up to 900000 I'm not sure why that happened. To tell them what school buildings need repair, what needs to be done, and what kids should attend certain schools, look at attendance assignments. Should taxpayers pay almost a million dollars for this study? Shouldn't we do it in-house? And if so, should the money be going out of state? Ogie. I'm just flabbergasted by this, Jim. I might have to go speak to that, that august body of my elected representatives. That's my, that's my tax money going... Nine hundred thousand yeah, dollars. I know. I, it's, it's a done I deal, but they, have, they haven't started it yet. But it's a done deal. It's been signed. Sheriff, I'm, I'm bothered by this. I, I, I've got. I hate to spend that kind of money, but if you are going to spend it, I want to spend it locally. I think the local people will better understand what's happening here locally than bringing some, in, someone in from out of state or out of the area. Yeah, I mean to make help with school assignments and well, this school needs this and that school needs that, and we need to shift some students over. And we have to pay somebody nine hundred thousand dollars from Florida to yeah, do that. Key. Exactly. Don't they have maintenance people who actually do that for a living? <laughs> yeah. Say so we got a leak in the <laughs> right. We have a leak. We have this. Can't they combine the information yeah. and then get a local group to contract out to do the work? Is that is yeah, that this, too much? Yeah. This company. This company will not be doing any work. They're just doing studies and. But I'm saying the maintenance people can act. They already yeah. know what's broken. Yeah. They already know what needs to be fixed. Yeah. But Why do you need nine hundred thousand dollar company? No, they're themselves? saying they'll help help them with school student reassignment. Oh, whatever. please. Well, yeah, I can help them with school board. Covers, yeah. them. <laughs> covers what it is. All right, guys. Uh, let's talk about something that we all have sort of opinions on, and and sheriff will be especially interested in your opinion on this uh, for Scythe County, though. Uh, is going to sue opioid manufacturers in order to recoup the money they've shelled out for emergency services, police services, child welfare, welfare costs, they say due to drug abuse. Are you guys okay with blaming manufacturers for people who abuse prescription drugs? Now, some of it is heroin, well, and the sheriff can talk to that, but, oh, do you have a, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I have some interest in that, Jim. A lot of these people are getting strung out after a legitimate injury, and then once the prescription runs out, they turn to heroin. But if you're going to sue the manufacturers, let's go ahead and talk about the doctors who are overprescribing these things or the legislators who refuse to allocate money for Narcan or for treatment or for rehabilitation or for prevention. A lot of blame to pass, go around on this thing. Sure. Again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree with Ogie because of the fact that doctors are sometimes prescribing too many, too much drugs. Right. And uh, that needs to be taken care of. In fact, there's laws uh, on the books to, to handle that. There is. And that's something that we should be enforcing those key quickly. The, the, the treatment on addictions mm -hmm. are minimal. The access to these drugs are easily obtained. Uh, they have to do something. And I think the sheriff said something off camera that you, you, you're putting people in jail that are addicted. That's, that, that's, that's wrong. wrong. That, that is wrong. wrong. All right, guys, a recent poll shows that either Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden could defeat, defeat Donald Trump in 2020 for the presidency and by a wide margin. Either of these men likely to run in 2020, guys, and if they do, can they win? Okay. No, I don't see that. I think the Democrats need some new blood, some Cory Booker or some <coughs> Gavin Newsom blood in there, or right. Kamala Harris. And what about this Kennedy fellow that did the He did response? well, I thought. Yeah, he, he's an up-and-comer. All right, Sheriff. Uh, they might beat him at backgammon or something like that, but they're not going to beat him any other way. <laughs> Keith, uh, Joe Biden would have beat him this time. Well, I think yeah, so. Yeah. I think so. But yeah. we're talking yeah. now 2020. Yeah. Yeah. I think Joe Biden is actually going to run. I, I really believe Joe Biden is going to run. You know, he's gotten past his son's death. Well, I mean, right. as much as you can. Right. And I think that in order for the Democratic Party to come together, I think Joe Biden and a young person for vice president would probably be their ticket. So you think if Joe Biden ran with Cory Booker or Cory Kamala Booker Harris, or Kamala could, Harris or someone like that's that. That's interesting. All right. I, I wasn't really impressed with the Kennedy guy. I mean, he's smart, but he sounded a little bit robotic. But I don't know. Anyway. Uh, okay. Finally, guys, a nightclub in Las Vegas now has robot strippers. Guys, have you ever seen any robot strippers? And would you like to see robot strippers? Ogie. I really don't get this at all. I mean, I, I'm going to pay money to see a robot yeah, yeah. stripper. I just don't yeah. get it. And now to George Jetson, the sheriff of uh, <laughs> Guilford County. What do you think? I like the looks of my car, but I ain't paying money <laughs> really? to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Keith, have you seen any robot strippers? Or <laughs> No, I think the sheriff said it best. I mean... 
please. Yeah. I, I don't want to see a robot stripper. No. But I've never seen strippers before. I was a, I was a robot stripper. I was a robot stripper. My robot stripper name was Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's all the time we have. Oh, except for the... Except for this, a camel has been disqualified. This is a true story. A camel's been disqualified from a beauty contest in Saudi Arabia because she had been injected with Botox. Asked why he cheated, the camel owner said, well, I knew her camel was close to winning, and I thought the Botox would get her over the hump. <laughs> mm. It's a Botox. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. for all of us robot strippers here, I'm Jim Longworth. We'll see you next week.